Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Thomas Felder, and I'm here with Pastor Anthony Burrell. And we are here for another edition of the Daniel and Revelation Bible series. And today we are on Revelation chapter 15. Today we are on Revelation chapter 15. Hopefully you have enjoyed the Bible study, but more importantly, we hope that you have been blessed and transformed and grown, grown closer to God and more willing now to read your Bible for yourself. Uh, as we start today, let's pray and then we'll jump right in. We're gonna do two chapters today, chapter 15 and 16. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your kindness towards us. We cannot make it without you. Hide us behind the cross and we surrender today's Bible study to you. Cover us, Father, and transform us in your holy son, Yahshua's name. Amen, amen, and amen again. Uh, I was telling a few people before we started on today's call that, that, that we are looking at the difference between six and seven. Pastor Burrell mentioned it before. We cannot get to seven unless we get over six. There are 49 different times in Revelation where it talks about seven, seven churches, seven lambs, seven, seven eyes, seven judgments, seven seals. And we'll never get there. We get stuck on six. Six is man above, man in the middle, and man below. So as we jump into today's Bible study, the title of it is No More Mercy. No More Mercy. Pastor Burrell is going to give us a little recap as we jump into Revelation 15. And when we're done, we're going to roll right into Revelation 16. Good morning, Pastor Burrell. Good morning. So, all right, we've been in the book of Revelation and we've been studying. And a lot of times this book can be intimidating and has a lot of info. But once you start reading through it, you see that it has a really simple outline. Uh, two words that help me to kind of remember what's going on in Revelation. The major flow is the sanctuary and the number seven. So if you can just remember sanctuary and seven, it really starts to make sense how this book unfolds. Because every time we look up, we see Jesus in his sanctuary. And normally he's going to unpack a vision for us in the series of a seven. Okay, so we open the book. We saw Christ in his sanctuary. He was taking care of his church. And so he shows us a vision of seven letters to his church. He lays out the whole history of his church. And then after that, we see Christ above being enthroned in heaven. And he takes, you know, the title deed to the history of the human race, because if his sacrifice was not accepted, if he did not raise from the dead, human history would not have continued. So he opens up a scroll. And as human history continues, he lays out for us a second time, the history of his church. That just shows us that Christ cares a lot about his people. He cares a lot about his church that he takes twice to lay out that history for us to show how he was going to protect his church, how he was going to empower his church as she carried forth his mission and his gospel message throughout time. Now, then after you look at seven churches and seven seals being opened, we got to a portion called seven trumpets and the trumpet blast was a warning of judgment to God's enemies, and it was a note of joy to God's people that their deliverance was coming soon. And so whenever the trumpet would blast, people would know that it was time to repent and get right with God, because you're either going to be found on the right side or the wrong side of God. And so when we looked at those seven trumpets, we saw historical events of how God judged the enemies of his people. And we see historically that the enemies of God's people have always been Rome always been Rome. And the seven trumpets especially unpacked for us how it was political Rome attacking the church and then religious Rome corrupting the church. And so we saw seven churches. We saw seven seals. Then we saw seven trumpets. And, and then we kind of got into this whole section where there was a break off where God took one more time just to uncover all of the history of the great controversy. In other words, uh, we see this story about God's church and the enemies of his church, but he took us back to say, look, it started a long time ago before there was an earth, before there was even such thing as a church on this earth. It started with a dragon named Satan in heaven. He started to go to war against God in heaven. God slapped him down to this earth. And ever since then, he's always been attacking God's people. He attacked Israel but he failed because the Messiah came. He attacked the Messiah, but even though Christ died, he was raised again. And so then he focuses energy on God's church. In Revelation 13 and 14, we saw how this is all going to climax. 
into a final crisis. Satan's going to try one more time to get the worship and the loyalty of this whole earth. He's going to try to put God's follow true followers to death. It's something that's called the mark of the beast. And in chapter 14, we saw the last day movement, the last day message that calls out this mark of the beast and teaches people how to trust in Jesus and not to receive that mark of the beast. Okay, so we have Christ in the sanctuary unfolding history throughout seven, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets. And he takes us back and tells us the story one more time, the war in heaven to the final battle on this earth and how we can be victorious. That brings us to chapter 15 today, which is very serious. You see, the title of our study today is No More Mercy, because we see in chapter 15, the very first verse tells us that the wrath of God is filled up. Now, Brother Felder, come help us to understand. How is it? What does this mean that there's no more mercy, that the time is coming where the wrath of God is filled up? Well, let's just jump right into the text. And we'll let the Bible do the talking. Here we are in Revelation 15, verse 1. Revelation 15, verse 1. And it says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And here is the introduction to the seven last plagues. Mm. And when it says seven, you know that that means it's complete. It's done. And we have the seven last plagues, meaning that there are no more plagues after this, but this is the full rollout of God's wrath and his judgment coming on people, right? So let's go on and pick up at verse two, Revelation 15, verse two. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. John is actually seeing forward now into the future, and he sees the redeemed standing on the sea of glass. And the reason it says that it looks like it's mingled with fire, it is the brightness of God's glory shining off of this transparent gold, and they are standing on it. So this is after the seals have come. This is after Christ has come. This is after they are redeemed, and they have gotten the victory. I remember Sister Sandra was saying that sometimes when God gives news, he mm -hmm. always gives good news, then bad news, then good news. That's what's going on right now. John is letting you know that this thing is going to end and it's going to be all right. He is going to protect us. And we are just getting a tiny snapshot on that. It's a tiny snapshot. Let me run forward to verse, verse three, verse three. Revelation 15, three, and it says, and they sing the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous are thy works, mm. Lord God almighty, just and true are thy ways, thy king of saints. Remember I told you, this is the song of Moses and the lamb. You don't have to worry about waiting till you get to heaven to know the words of the song. Here they are. These people are singing praises right after the plagues. Why are they singing praises? Because God protected them and brought them through it. Amen. Right, And look who they're giving the praise to, the Father, Lord God Almighty. They are recognizing who to give the praise to. That would be a lesson for all of us on earth. If we want to know what true worship and true praise looks like, all we've got to do is take a picture of what they do in heaven. Verse 4, Amen. who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Mm. Pastor Burrell, you want to pick up with five? Amen. Verse five says, after that, and after that, excuse me, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with the golden girdles. Okay, so this is very important. Now we see, we've seen this repeated twice. We're just getting set up to see these seven last plagues that come in chapter 16. But notice again that it says the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The testimony was nothing other than the Ten Commandments. And we saw in chapter 11 how the ark of God's testimony or the ark of his covenant was seen. So it's pointing forward to this time of final judgment because men and women have decided to reject God's commandments. But now the heavens are open and they're going to have to answer for their decisions that they've made. 
So we want to make sure that through faith in Jesus Christ, we obey the commandments, not that we reject them and violate them. Awesome. Just one other thing. These are 10 eternal commands that never change. Mm. And if you ever wonder what the testimonies are, just look at Exodus 31, 18. And he says, and he gave Moses when he had made an end of communing with them upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So I want you to know when it says tab uh, tabernacle of testimony, those are God's 10 commandments. The original still stand. And God is going to make sure that before he comes back, that we're going to know exactly what they are. Amen. Right? Verse seven, Pastor Burrell. Amen. And one of the four beasts, we've seen the four living creatures, gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And that's serious when it says that these vials are full of the wrath of God. Now notice verse eight, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now this is very important because now we see that the temple of God in heaven is empty. His glory has filled the temple and no man. That means two things. That means Christ has left his temple in heaven and he's done. Christ is a mediator or an intercessor. That means that Christ prays for his people. He prays for people to find salvation, for people to receive grace, for people to find mercy. So when you see a vision of the sanctuary and Christ is not there, that means that the day of mercy has ended. Like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, today is the day of salvation meaning that there's a day coming when salvation will no longer be available. A very serious moment the Bible is calling us to look to and understand. We have to make our choice now. The next moment is not promised. And that also means when it says no man was in the temple, that there are no more cases being accepted, okay? Today is the day you give your case to God. You say, Lord, I know I've sinned. I know I've transgressed. My character is not right. I have not obeyed your law. I need you to forgive my sins, cleanse me, fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live an obedient life here and now so I can serve you and witness for your kingdom here and now. And you have to make that choice now because you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Your life is but a breath. It goes up in smoke, literally. And so now we're looking at that point where there's no man in the temple. Christ is not there. Nobody else's cases are being received. It's empty probation has closed. Now we're going to see the wrath of God coming upon this world. Awesome. So we just gave you a quick high level overview of Revelation 15. And we're going to spend more time now on Revelation 16. And our caption for Revelation 16 is Avenger, wrath of God. Avenger, uh. wrath of God. I know everybody loves these cartoon series about the Avengers, but the Bible says in Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. When you're watching these cartoons, understand that it is making a mockery of heaven. You Mercy. got a bunch of demigods, people who are God Mercy. men, who's saying that they will take revenge. God says, nope, that's for me to do. Wow. And so here we wow. see, as we go into these plagues, the plagues are going to be poured out. And it appears to be in a very short period of time. Because as we go through Revelation, we're going to find that people are going to still be suffering from plague one when we get up to plague five. Right? So it's going to be a short period of time. God is not going to roll these plagues out on all of the places at one time. Or, or else the whole world would be destroyed. We would never get to plague seven if all of them happened at one time. And who is the plague poured out on? The plague is, the plague is poured out on people who receive the mark of the beast, hmm. worship his image, uh, have his number on their forehead or on their hand. So these are things that we need to look out for, all right? And so these plagues are God's full wrath gonna be poured out. Uh, let's go and start with uh, some background quickly on the gods of Egypt. We saw these plagues, some of them before, with the 10 plagues that fell on Egypt. And when we had the 10 plagues that fell on Egypt, each plague was to attack a specific god of Egypt. For example, when the water was turned to blood, the first plague, it was against Happy, which is the spirit of the Nile, 
It was also against Kunim, which is the guardian of the river source, and Osiris, who claimed that the Nile was his bloodstream. So because Osiris, who claimed that the Nile was his bloodstream, guess what God did? He turned it into literal blood, mm, right? Wow. We had frogs. Frogs also represent, represented some of the gods that they had. Happy was a frog. Um, frog goddess to Egypt. It, it also represented the goddess of fertility, right? So when God brought the plagues, what was the next plague that he brought? He brought frogs. Then there was lice. Seb said that he was the god of earth and he can control all of the insects and animals, etc. So what did God do? He brings lice. In every instance, God is showing that he is the true creator. He is the true source. He is the true power. And it goes all the way down the list with the flies, with the disease on cattle, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and the death of the firstborn. We're going to see a simulation of these same plagues pour out. These are the Egyptian plagues on the screen, one through 10. These plagues, the first six line up with the seals, right? They line up with the seals. We saw the blood. We saw, we saw war, which the frogs represented. We saw gnats, which represented the famine on the Egyptians' food source. We saw flies, and flies come after something is dead, which is the pale horse. We saw disease. Disease killed the people. And that was when they were martyrs that we saw in the um, fifth seal. And then there were boils. Boils represent a natural judgment, right? And then there's the announcement of the trumpets. When we look at the trumpets, again, we see the same exact four or five of the same seals, but they're only on a third of the earth. Remember a third of the Roman Empire? But as we see these seals come to a culmination, eventually they will happen all over the earth. They will happen all over the earth. So just wow. take a look at that. And here's a quick rundown of the seven trumpets versus the seven plagues, right? So we find that in the first trumpet, it was hail and fire and blood cast on the earth. On the seven plagues, we find a vial poured on the earth. We find a burning mountain cast into the sea. And the That's second right. vial is poured out on the sea, right? A third, a great star fell on the rivers and fountains. And then we see a vial poured out on the rivers and fountains. What is important between the, the difference between the sea and a river? On the sea is salt water. We can't drink mm -hmm. seawater, but we drink water on the rivers and fountains. That's clean, fresh water. So one set of water is used for commerce and the other one is used for life sustenance for us to, to, to live. So these things are, are really important. We see in the fourth part of the sun, the moon and the stars are smitten. And then we see here, the fourth vial is poured out on the sun. One of the things that these gods, these um, gods that these people worship was the sun. They worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. So God afflicts them with the very things that they claim to worship. We have been talking about sun worship all the way through since we started with Daniel. And here it is. He says, you want the sun? I'll give it to you. Right, Pastor Burrell? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a quick point here that what we're looking at as we look at the parallel is that God is a merciful God. He's not going to bring final wrath on the earth until he's already shown us an example of what his wrath looks like. I think Sister Sandra tells us quite often that God does not punish severely until he has warned clearly. So basically, when you see those seven trumpet judgments that came upon Rome, they're written parallel. So you can say, look, go in history and see what happened to the Roman Empire because they rebelled against God. That's going to come upon the whole world of everybody who rebelled against God at the end of time. So even in God's wrath or his, or his judgments, you see mercy that he's already given us an example to warn us so we can make up our minds to be loyal to him and to love him right here, right now. Amen. Look at number five for the seven trumpets. It talks about a bottomless pit was open. And when that was happened, Islam came up and we'll see God is going to pour out a vial on the bottomless pit, which is the papacy, and it will mm -hmm. be destroyed. The four angels held back the Euphrates. The Euphrates had to be dried up in order for um, Cyrus to come through and rescue God's people from Babylon. The same exact thing is going to happen here in Revelation 16. And lastly, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord. And we will see that happen when the seventh vial is poured out. All right, so let's go ahead to uh, Revelation 16, verse 1. Pastor Burrell. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways 
and pour out the vials of, of, of the wrath of God upon the earth. So here we have it. These plagues are poured out. They're not universal. If they were universal, everybody would perish at the same time. But these disasters will, will gradually get worse and worse and worse, and the people will still not repent. Let's go on to verse 2. All right. In verse 2, it says, And the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. So a couple important things come out. Like uh, Brother Felder told us, in each of these plagues, it identifies a place and it identifies a punishment. Okay, you see the place, it comes upon the earth. The punishment is a noisome and grievous sore. That means a foul, putrefying sore. You know, this picture right here is pretty graphic. Boils and blisters, uh, they hurt, they sting, they burn, but they, all, they also, you know, they ooze this pus and it's this foul smelling odor. That's what's going to cover uh, the people. And also notice the important detail that this comes after the Mark of the Beast conflict, okay? So the Mark of the Beast is given first people have their chance to make up their mind to say yes or no, either yes to God and no to the beast or yes to the beast and no to God. And after they've made up their mind, then comes the judgment. That's the final test, okay? We're preparing today, but the final test is the mark of the beast. After it's done, you see this is the first judgment poured out that there's a noisome and grievous sore. When you look at Revelation 18, 4, it says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. So God That's gives right. these people warning. And as we talk about these plagues, I don't want you to panic. God always protects his people. In Psalms 91, verses 7 and 8, he says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand shall fall at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thy see the reward of the wicked. So I want y'all to understand that while you see all of these things going on during the seven last plagues, if you are sealed, if you are sealed, you'll be protected. You will be protected. So the important right. thing is let's get ready with God first before these things start to happen. Seek him while he may be found. Amen. Pastor Rell, verse three. Amen. Amen. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. So now notice, what's the place? And he pointed this out very clearly. The place of this judgment is the sea. What's the punishment of this judgment? It becomes like blood, and every creature in the sea dies. I, I, wanna, I wanna notice an important point. What you see happening in Bible prophecy is this. It's like, wait a second. I thought the book of Revelation was highly symbolic. So when we see... Uh, uh, sores on people. When we see the sea becoming like blood, why aren't we interpreting this as some symbol? Well, there is an important prophetic principle that as we get closer to the coming of Christ and the end of the age, the events in Revelation get more and more literal. And why would we do that? It's because it's a biblical principle that Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, now we see in a glass dimly but then face to face. In other words, the, the closer we get to the perfect age, that is the coming of Christ and his kingdom, the light shines clearer and we see that, okay, these are not symbolic events. This is literally going to happen. People are going to have a sore. The sea is going to become as blood. Also notice that God is drawing a line, okay? He's drawing a line. He's drawing a line between discipline and retribution, okay? Every bad thing that happens right now is just a discipline. That is God through trial, through suffering, trying to get us to be sober, to think clearly, to prioritize our life so that he's first. And the truth is, we typically think more clearly and we prioritize God first when things are not easy, when we go through difficulty. So God perfects us through trial. The Bible teaches that so many times. I don't have time to repeat them all. But now we get to this point, you're going to see that this is not, these are not judgments to correct people. These are literal judgments that are punitive. They are retribution. They are punishments. Don't let anybody get out here telling you that because God is a loving God, that he will not actually punish his creation 
for its continued rebellion. We see the line clearly drawn that these judgments, they're so grievous, they're so, they're so startling because this is what it looks like when God is now punishing, not disciplining, not disciplining with the hope of correction. That's gone. This is strictly punishment. Oh, uh, you know, one thing you, you pointed out that these plagues are no longer symbolic. That was the same thing that we saw in Daniel. In Daniel, mm. remember Daniel 2, it was symbolic of the, the statue. Daniel 7, it was the animals. But by the time we got to Daniel 11, he's calling out very specific situations with Anthony and Cleopatra. He's calling out Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus. He's getting down to the nitty gritty. And that's what we see here. One thing I still want to emphasize is that the sea is primarily for international commerce, travel, food, oceans. Earlier on, and we were in um, Revelation 14, sorry, Revelation 13, the beast power said that he was in control of these things. He controlled commerce. He controlled your ability to buy and sell. And God says, you know what? I control the ability to buy and sell. I will shut down the, the oceans and, and commerce and, and planes and trains and things traveling. So this is really important. God is showing up every time to show that he can bind Satan's plans and execute as, as he wills, showing his wow. omnipotence. All right. So let's go on to verse, verse four, pass for up. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. So here we have the place, the rivers and fountains of waters and the punishment, they became blood. And it's like Elder Felder is saying, everything that people were trying to protect through their rebellion, God is taking away, right? Because the whole mark of the beast comes down to, to people saying, look, God, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not going to do that because I got I to gotta look out for me. I got to look out for mine. All right. So he takes their health. There's a noisome and grievous sort. He takes their commerce. He cuts off the seas. Now what? He's taking the drinking water, right? The sea is where we travel on, but the rivers and fountains are where we drank from, where we source our water from. And so, and so brothers and sisters, the point is there's no point in trying to, to protect your resources, your money, your property, if it means compromising against God. I believe it's Brother Felder who ends every call by saying, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul, right? So, so don't give into this temptation that you have to somehow protect yourself by compromising against God. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. He takes care of the needs. He takes care of the resources you need to survive and to, and to, and to do work for his kingdom. So in verse five, it says, and I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. When God is introduced like that, it, it's saying he's the eternal God. That's what his name means, the I am. The I am means he always is, he's always present. And, and that's saying that, look, we know that God's judgments are fair because he sees a bigger picture than we can understand. We think of everything past, present, and future. God sees all that at one time. And so when the angels worship him saying, look, you're the eternal God. This is what you've decided to do. We know that it's fair. Verse six, why? For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Well, when did they do all the shedding of the blood of saints and prophets? Remember how it says that the beast, um, sorry, how, remember how it says that they give life to the image of the beast? that it should speak and it should cause all those who will not worship the image of the beast to die, to be killed, okay? That means that people are out, who are out here preaching this truth that, that the Sabbath is the seventh day, that's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, that we must obey God's commands, that yes, we're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ, but if we really have that faith alone, we're gonna walk after his law. People who are out here preaching that are gonna be put to death. And God is not going to take it lightly. He's not just going to sit back and watch his people be killed and slain forever. He's been doing that. He watched him kill his son. He watched him murder his apostles and murder generations of true Christians for corruption and greed. And God is standing up saying no more. That's why it says verse seven. And I heard a, 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 another, excuse me. And I heard another out of the altar saying, even so, Lord God almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Even so, even though it's gruesome, even though it's brutal, God is righteous. And notice that voice always comes out of the altar. Why? Because that altar is where our prayers are stored up. 
Think about all the Christians that pray. Think, think about the Christian mother that prayed, Lord, they're killing us, protect my family. And she prayed a prayer Her in full faith. She said, God, please don't let them come and kill my family. We want to witness, we want to serve your name no matter what. And think about even though she prayed that prayer, they came in and they snatched her baby and they impaled her baby on a spike, even though she prayed. Do you think God didn't hear that prayer? Do you think God didn't answer that prayer? No, God says, don't worry, you pray that prayer, you have to hold your faith firm. That prayer is gonna be answered. I've already answered it because he's eternal. But now this is where we're seeing the answer. That's why that voice always comes out of the altar. So we're watching God answer prayers for justice that his people have prayed throughout centuries that it didn't look like they had an answer. Now we're seeing that answer coming. Awesome. You know, there, there are two things. Remember you were saying that the, the mother who has the baby and she's crying out. That takes me back to Revelation 6 verse 10 where the mm -hmm. souls were crying out from under the altar, asking God, who will avenge their blood? And so God responds, blood for blood, right? Wow. Cheek for cheek, you know, he, he responds likewise, and he, he, he ups the ante, he ups the ante. All wow. right, so let's go to um, verse eight, verse eight, Pastor Burrell. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, that's the place. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. In other words, the sun is another resource we look to. Obviously it gives light, but it also gives life to plants. The sun is, is important. That's why people have worshiped the sun because it is important. It gives life to plants. Plants give life to animals. Many people eat animals and that powers and fuels all the work they do through the day. But what God is saying is no, I'm the creator God, remember? It says, worship the creator. One of the primary sins of man is idolatry, where we worship the creature instead of the creator. We worship the created things instead of the one who created. In other words, we only want God for what he can give to us. We don't want to actually let him rule over us as authority. So that's why people will worship the sun. That's why they turn to Sunday, because they only want the resource. They don't want the source, okay? Okay. They don't want the source of all life, all wisdom, all joy. That's God. They just want the resource. They say, look, I don't want your law. I just want to live. I want to eat. I want to prosper. I want to enjoy life. And they don't understand that true joy in life comes from submission to the heavenly master. And so now God shows, look, you worship the sun. You're turning to this Sunday to keep that. When I said the Sabbath day, the seventh day, I'm going to show you who really has power over the sun. The same sun that I gave as a blessing to shine light and to give life, I can take that same sun and turn it up and now it scorches men with fire. Verse nine, and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And notice, they repented not to give him glory. Here's where you see the justice of God. Remember how I told you these are not corrective disciplines? Like, you know, you will discipline a child hoping to correct the behavior, to, to correct the character. No, no, no. God is showing, look, I'm, I'm just, I'm fair. I'm not just relentlessly taking out my vindictiveness upon suffering people. No. Notice how even though they're suffering greatly, they can't drink, they're getting scorched by the sun, their bodies are sick. Notice how they will not turn to God. They're not saying, I'm sorry. You know, a, a, a smart person will at least say, I'm sorry. I mean, Judas was a wicked man, but he at least said, I'm sorry. He was like, he at least said, look, I did a wrong thing, right? These people are not even as good as Judas. They don't even say we're wrong. They just repented not to give God glory. So just notice God's fairness. And he's saying, look, you worship the sun. Let me show you who's more powerful than the sun. I see a couple of points that I wanted to bring out here. I see, first of all, that these people are still reeling from the first three plagues because it says at this point that, that and when men would scorch a great heat and they blaspheme the name of God, so it, they, they are getting the first, second, and third plague, plague going on so that we know it's not a long period of time because how long can you go without drinking water? You know, how long can people wow. last without water? How long can you go without resources there are some people who live off the, the the resources from the sea but like you said he ups the ante 
and now he's burning them with the very sun that they were worshiping. And that takes me to Romans 121, Romans 121. And it says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. They reached the point that they couldn't repent, even if they wanted to. Judas couldn't repent. He was sorrowful, but not repentant. We have got to get past the point that we are sorrowful and get to the point that we are repentant, meaning that we want to change. These people claim to be righteous. Remember, they said, Lord, Lord, uh, and the miracles that they did. Now it is obvious that they won't repent. It is obvious their true characters are coming out. It's like that song where it says, I can see your true colors shining through. And that's what you see here. Their true mm. colors under punishment and pain, your true colors come out. Who you really are comes out when you hit the Mercy. nail on your, your finger. The true you comes out. So here we see these seven trumpets over here, and we see the seven plagues, right? So remember the fourth part of the sun, moon, and stars were smitten, which was Rome being destroyed with his leadership. But here we see the literal sun is smitten, the literal sun. And you know, it's funny that the scientists are always talking about we're going to have some, um, what's that thing they were talking about, Pasparel, that the heat, the uh, the sun is the ozone layer is being destroyed and it's oh, global out. warming. Yeah, global warming. Global right. warming. So yeah, yeah. I mean, they see it coming. They see Mercy it coming. God. God is letting them know. They they check in their barometers. So here's two verses where God gives you a promise, even despite adversity. Right? The first one is Isaiah 33, 15 and 16, and a part of 41 and 17. I kind of clipped it together. But it says God's promises when the poor and needy shall seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them, and I, the God yeah. of Israel, will not forsake them. I'm giving you these verses. So if you are in the predicament that, that these people are in, meaning that when you are one of the 144,000 and you see this going on, I want you to remember Isaiah 33, 15 and 16, also Psalms 121, verses 5 and 7. It says, the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Remember those promises. Put them in your pocket. You know, in case of emergency, you pull them out. Pass for up. Wow. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So we've seen this seat of the beast. This is the seat of the beast given to him by Satan himself, the throne of the beast. This is literally located in Rome, okay? So now the judgments are starting to get pinpointed. God is going to the source of who took the lead in deceiving the whole world like this. Let me bring it home. So Rome is specifically getting hit with this judgment of darkness, darkness, and they gnaw their tongues for pain. I mean, just, just try to imagine boils and sores, extreme thirst and the thirst is elevated by extreme heat so of course there's going to be great pain like uh, imagine like you, you know you know how when you were a kid and you lost a tooth how you kept on you know using your tongue trying to soothe that spot that the tooth just came out just imagine being in such great pain that you're chewing on your tongue just trying to soothe the pain and verse 11 even while they're trying to soothe their pain verse 11 says what and they blaspheme the god of heaven why because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. So even down to number five, there's still no repentance. You know, Pastor Morella, I also think, why wouldn't they just turn the lights on? If there's uh, darkness, why wouldn't they turn the lights on? Wow. You know, if I thought about it and you thought about it, God thought about it, right? That's right. That's so right. God is going to send some earthquakes in a minute. He's going to send earthquakes and, and earthquakes knock out power. So That's now right. you have no artificial power, and now you're sitting in the dark with the sores and the pain. Just something to think about. God thought about all of this in advance, Mercy. right? Because we're we're recalcitrant. We're wicked, evil people. If God took away the sun, we just turn the light on to keep it moving. Mercy. Verse twelve. Verse twelve. Pastor. Wow. Now we're now we're getting close. We're getting close, brothers and sisters. And the sixth angel. And I remember, we always say you got to pay attention to number six. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon where? the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So what is the river Euphrates? 
it is the river or the resource that Babylon sat on top of. Babylon sat on top of. Spoiler alert, okay? We're going to see a woman in tomorrow's chapter sitting on top of many waters. And those waters, Revelation 7, verse 15, are peoples, nations, and multitudes, and languages. In other words, the great river Euphrates dries up. Now the judgments are coming home to Rome, to the Vatican, to the papacy, and the time is coming where because of this great suffering, people are actually going to turn on the papacy so that the many waters she sits on top of are going to leave her. They're going to dry up from her. They're going to turn around on her. And we read about the same thing happening in tomorrow's chapter. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that, Mr. Feldman? Yeah, I think a lot of times when people read this Kings of the East, they believe that Iraq and Iran is going to come and destroy Rome. And 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 that very well may be part of the ultimate uh, plan. But But more clearly, when you look at the Bible, it says, after Cyrus conquered Babylon, he freed the Israelites from captivity by drying up the Euphrates River. So when the Euphrates River dries up, it means that they have no more support. All of these nations that were backing up Rome are no longer going to back them up because they see that Rome cannot protect them from the plagues of God. If you can't provide me water, you can't give me commerce, you can't protect me from the heat of the sun or from these boils, why should I trust you in anything else? Mm. Cyrus is the king from the east, and he becomes a symbol of Christ. His name also means anointed. When we look at Isaiah 44, uh, 24, it says that God, through his prophet Isaiah, calls his shepherd and his anointed. That is what he calls Cyrus. So these kings of the east are Jesus. They represent Jesus as the king of kings who comes with his army. Remember, he's the Lord of hosts. He comes with his army. He represents the kings of the east. Here's a biblical text for you, Ezekiel 44 uh, and Ezekiel 46, verses 1 and 2 in both chapters. It says, it must not be open. It is talking about the gates to Jerusalem. One gate facing the east. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut because the Lord God of Israel has entered through it. He says, the gate facing the east is to be shut on six working days, but on the Sabbath day and on the day of the new moon, it is to be open when the prince is to enter. Who is our prince? None other, none other than Michael. Remember in Amen. Revelation, I mean, in, in Daniel 12, 1, he says, Michael, your prince will stand up. And he stands up. This gate is only open on the Sabbath day. So it appears that all of these sevens, there are 49 different groups of sevens in the book of Revelation. It appears that God will end this thing on his Sabbath day because that's when the gate is open and the prince comes through the east gate. Mm. Wow. It all kind of comes together. If you if you stay wow. with it, it comes together. Can you imagine that? On the seventh day Sabbath, God comes through and he ends it all. All right, verse 11, verse 13, I'm sorry. Well, you know, you know, <laughs> Brother Felder, that, that would make it really easy for God to protect his people because they'd all be together. They'd or not be. all, but they'd be in little pockets throughout the earth. They'd be together, you know, worshiping him. So he would be able to shield them with his grace. That's that's a that's an interesting thought. That's powerful. Verse 13 says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of who? The mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. What are we talking about here? Well, notice the number three and notice who they're coming from. We know who the dragon is. Revelation 12, verse 9, that's Satan. We know who the beast is. Revelation 13, verse 1, there's a beast that comes out of the sea that was given its power, seat, and great authority by Satan. Okay, now, who is the false prophet? Well, a prophet is nothing more than a spokesperson. It speaks on behalf of another. And so after that beast comes out of the sea in Revelation 13 and verse 1, we see another beast in Revelation 13 verse 11 coming out of the land that speaks on behalf. It exercises all of the authority of the first beast which came before it. So we're looking at what I like to call an unholy trio, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's that Satan has this little confederacy that he's gotten together that does his work. Satan is like the leader. Uh, uh, the beast is his main source, but then even the beast has a representative. And we identified that that is United States and the false Christianity of the United States will unite with the false Christianity of Catholicism. They're all inspired by Satan. What's the point here? Notice it's three unclean spirits like frogs. 
This is Satan's answer to the three angels, those three last powerful gospel messages that come to warn and prepare the world. Uh, think of it like this, brother. Satan does not go down easy. You can accuse him of a lot of things. He's evil, he's rebellious, but he's not lazy. He will fight to the utter end. And you would think like, come on, by now, he has to know he really can't win, but he's that deceived. He's that bent on his ultimate end of really trying to overthrow God. He still thinks he has a chance. So even when God sends the powerful messages of the three angels, he sends these three unclean spirits to counteract. And also frogs are very important because Brother Felder gave us that awesome background of the plagues in Egypt. You notice that the frogs were the first of the plagues that the Egyptian magicians could not counterfeit. They could not counterfeit. And so what we see is that while God has three true everlasting gospel messages, Satan has three false messages trying to counteract. I wish I could break them down, but I won't right now for sake of time. Verse 14 says, they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to what? To the battle of that great day of God Almighty. He's sending out his deceptive spirits, his false messages. He's gathering people together to help him in his rebellion against God. They're, they, they're, they're coming to your door. He's trying to impose his thoughts, his media, his entertainment, his lies upon your household so that he can, he wants you to be his soldier to fight against God. It, brothers and sisters, it's not an accident that your child is rebellious. It's not an accident that, that uh, the problems in your household, the strife in your marriage, the disobedience and rebellion of your kids, the habits that you yourself struggle to overcome, it's not an accident. Satan is working diligently trying to get you to enlist in his army. And that's, and that's what we see happening here in uh, verse 13 and 14. Amen. <clears throat> I think you covered it. <laughs> Let's go to verse 15. And it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Do you remember when we were talking about the churches and uh, one of those churches had been attacked on two occasions? They had been robbed while everybody was sleeping. They were not uh. alert and aware. And so right. here we find this all over again. He says, I come as a thief. Doesn't mean that he's sneaking in. He, he comes while people are sleeping. And so we can't be sleeping. We've got to be watching. Not just watch. we got to keep our garments. That means that we have to constantly pray, constantly fast, constantly stay in touch with this word. If you don't stay in touch with this word, you're disconnected, man. This is your Mercy. lifeline. Amen. This is your lifeline. He said, lest, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So we have got to be covered with Christ's righteousness. We have got to do that. Uh, if you don't do it, it's going to be everlasting too late. So often we think that we are good enough. We use ourselves as our own barometer of righteousness or our mom or our pastor or somebody else. But no, that is not who we, who we measure up against. We measure up against Christ. And once we do that, we recognize that whatever our garment looks like, the Bible says it is as filthy rags. So we have to recognize that now we, we got to do it because there's something coming. Remember, we talked about that once he says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. We have got to seek him while he may be found. That's can, I, can I just um, say this? And we're going to read verse 16. I just want to say this. Brothers and sisters, Christ is merciful. Remember, we said you always got to pay attention to what happens at number six. You notice how even on the seven last plagues, this is a future vision for you and me now. He shows us so we can get ready. This is mercy. These are very gruesome plagues to think about, to imagine. And trust me, your imagination and mine, we can't really grasp exactly how intense this will be. But you notice how Christ still breaks in at number six? Christ still breaks in. He says, look, I'm coming unexpectedly. Now's the time to get right. And what he's saying, you got to learn how to stay right. That's the keeping your garments so that you don't walk naked. Let's go on to verse 16. We've come all the way down to, to seven. I just, just hear his voice. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the opportune time. They, uh, 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 excuse me, verse 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue called 
Armageddon. Okay, so everybody wants to know, man, what is Armageddon, man? You know, you, I, I think there's a movie out there called Armageddon. It's another apocalypse, doomsday kind of movie. Um, you see, Armageddon, it's, it's very simple. It's very simple. It says it's a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word. Um, as I studied, the best I can understand this is when you go back to a verse in Isaiah 14, and, and I'm sure Brother Felder has more light on this. Um, we see this word Armageddon in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. When we hear the rebellion of Lucifer, um, Isaiah 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? What did weaken the nations? Verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. So this is Lucifer's pride, his rebellion. This is how Lucifer, the light bearer, became Satan, the adversary. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Remember, it's all about the throne. It's all about worship. Um, and he says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation and the signs of the north. Now, the word mount of the congregation in Hebrew is harmoched, right? And when you pronounce it the way it's supposed to be pronounced, it sounds like Armageddon. That's the, you know, you know, biblical scholars have researched this thing. That's the best we can find is that this final battle for harmoched or the mount of the congregation is that final battle for worship. The same battle you hear about in Daniel 11, where the king of the north places his tents the palace of his tents between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, right? That's what the battle is about. It's about the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. Satan wants that throne, that position, that place of worship that belongs to God. And so, and so what is Satan doing? He's gathering people saying, no, trust me, do it my way. Uh, 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 notice that everything that we read about so far it's, it's, it's all Satan's character. The mark of the beast ultimately is Satan's character of selfishness. Satan wants God's authority, but he doesn't want God's character. Satan wants to be like God in the wrong way. He wants to rule himself. He wants to, he wants to make up his own standards of right and wrong for himself, but he doesn't want the love, the mercy and justice of God's character. That's what the, that's what the mark of the beast is all about. Everybody wants the authority that God has, that kind of power, but only a very few people actually see the loveliness of Jesus where they actually want the character of Christ. So that's what it means when it says he gathered them together into a, a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon or the Mount of the Congregation for the final battle. Amen. I want to let, I want to let everybody know that this is a literal battle. <laughs> it's going to be real bloodshed. And, you know, even the occultists and the spiritualists of the world are looking forward to this third battle. Mercy. They always talk about it. They call it World War III. And we think, or at least some people believe, that World War III is one nation against another nation, or America versus Russia, or China, or Iran, or Iraq. But no, World War III is the whole world unites against God. The same thing that went on at the Tower of Babel when Nimrod wanted to build a tower up to fight God and, and reproach God for bringing the flood. This is the nations of the world. That's what the three frogs represented, that the beast and the, and the, anti, the, beast, the apostate church uh, and the, the prophet go out because they want to convince all of these nations, let's come together and all of us together can defeat God. We even working on a, a space program now. We got with space cadets. What's the new thing that Trump rolled out? This uh, space force. Mm. They getting ready for it, man. They got they got binoculars that they are looking to see one day when Christ returns. The wicked of the world know what is going to happen. They just believe in the end that they will win. Wow. They know what's going to happen, but they believe that somehow that they can muster up enough manpower or wow. gunpower or whatever power to take out the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, wow. right? Wow. So let's go on to um, verse 17, verse 17. Verse 17, what is Jesus going to say to all this? It says, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into where? The air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, okay? Notice this voice doesn't come from the altar. This voice comes from the throne saying, it is done. OK, so so so, yeah, they're they're trying. They're gathering together. They're getting their um, uh, uh, weapons of war together. Christ says 
it is done. Excuse me, the throne, God, the Father says, it is done. Verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and, uh, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. That means the greatest earthquake this earth has ever seen. It all comes down. The thunder, God speaks. When Christ comes, the mountains and islands are moved out of their place. Lightning, he says his coming as his lightning flashes from the east up to the west. So shall the coming of the son of man be. He says, it's done. So now Christ himself is coming in person to just finish it off. Go ahead, Brother Felder. Amen. I just like to add a little bit here on this mighty earthquake. We have talked over and over again that when Christ comes, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive mm. will meet him in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. If you remember in Matthew 25, 52, it says that when, when um, Christ died, that there was a great earthquake. The tombs were open and the bodies of the saints who have fallen asleep were raised. This earthquake will be an earthquake like none other. So when he comes back this time, because the last time he says, it is finished, earthquake. Again, in the seventh plague, he's going to say, it is finished, earthquake. And this uh, earthquake is going to open the graves, man. And the dead in Christ will rise because the Bible says, that they will, um, we who are alive will see him and they will meet us in the, in the air. Watch out for this great earthquake because it is going to be the one that opens up the graves. The other thing is, it is also the earthquake that destroys this threefold power, this, this unholy trinity. It is this, this earthquake that destroys the beast, uh, the, his prophet, and, and destroys all of the powers on the planet. It is this earthquake that destroys it. They tried to come together. And he says, no, he's going to break it apart. And we find that coming up in the next verse. It says, and the city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. They tried to join together, and God broke it apart. He broke it apart. Remember, Rome had three parts, and, and if you put all three parts of Rome together, it covered the then known world. So here we have it. These three powers come together, the papacy, the apostate religion, and spiritualism, which is uh, the, the dragon that covers all of the occult religions, all of the Hinduism, all of the Buddhism, all of that is covered in it. They all come together. They think that they could defeat God, and he breaks them apart. And when he breaks them apart, it's done. Pastor Moreau? Amen. And this is, and this is important. Babylon is being judged. Um, you could go ahead to verse 20. And it says, and every island fled, and the mountains were not found. We find in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 21, it talks about the islands and the mountains falling in the sea. In Revelation 6, verses 14 and 17, it says, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and every free hid themselves in the caves among the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. And who is able to stand? They looking for rocks and mountains to hide them because his rocks and mountains fallen. They're already falling from the great earthquake and they want to jump up under it. We'd rather die than face God in judgment. Pastor Mercy. You know, brothers and sisters, we really need a childlike imagination to actually think about a mountain fleeing away, just being moved. I want you to remember that when, when God delivered his people out of Egypt and he opened the Red Sea, the Bible says that God opened the Red Sea with a blast from his nostrils, his nose. He just kind of huffed and puffed and the Red Sea splits apart. So what is it going to be like when Christ empties heaven to come and rescue his people. It's easy to see how Christ, you, you've seen you've seen somebody go on a rampage when they're angry. They just pick up, a, pick up a desk or a bookshelf and just throw it to the side. That's what it's going to be like. Christ is going to come in a whole island, just, just gone. You know, just imagine this, brothers and sisters. That same power that will execute vengeance and wrath is the same power that can cleanse us from our sins right now if we just say yes to God. Amen. Amen. And remember those tsunamis 
past Burrell, the tsunamis that wiped out islands. And that wasn't without the greatest earthquake ever. Right. So how these wow. islands disappear. All right, let's go on. Verse 21 says, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. Now, this is not just the hail. I'm in West Virginia. We had some hail out here. You know, you ride in the car, you hear tink to tink to tink tink to tink tink tink. It's annoying, but this is nothing like that. A talent. These are hailstones, each weighing between 75 and 100 pounds. 75 and 100 pounds. Do you realize that you can die if somebody drops a five pound brick on your head from high enough. So just imagine these 75 to 100 pound hailstones being thrown down out of heaven with great force. In other words, the, 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 the plagues increase in their intensity. And it says, and men blaspheme God because the plague of the hail. They're, they're not repentant at all. There's no thought in their mind that they're wrong, that they deserve this, that God is just, nope, they blaspheme God. Because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So notice, these plagues are not universal. They each have a specific location they target. God is desolating the earth. He is destroying the earth. He's executing his judgment. But we know that it's not universal because even after all the destruction, even after the boils on, on the skin, the seas become like blood. The, earth, uh, the, the uh, rivers become like blood. The sun scorches people. A darkness over the seed of the beast. After all of these plagues, the drying up of the river Euphrates, uh, uh, and now what we're looking at, this final great earthquake, after all of these plagues, the Bible says that there are still going to be people on this earth who are destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. So they're not universal, but they're very severe. They're very intense. God is executing his wrath. And what's the point that comes out? Even after God shows his wrath, there's no repentance. They continue to blaspheme God. They don't even admit that they're wrong. You know that when you're wrong, you can at least begrudgingly admit that you're wrong, even if your heart is not changed. They don't even do that. They don't even think to say, oh, well, God, I guess you're right. Nope, not even that. That's how hard their hearts are, how fully they're set in their sin and rebellion. Brothers and sisters, this is a warning. The only reason we have common sense today the only reason we're not complete savages and complete animals is because Christ, Holy Spirit is still here. It keeps the evil of this world at bay. It keeps it in check. So all the rapists and murderers and evil and corruption you see, this is still only a modified form. Eventually, Christ is going to take his Holy Spirit fully out of the picture and Satan is going to have 100% control of this earth the way he wants to. And this is what it will look like. Men who can get slammed with 100 pound hailstones and still not think to repent and still not think to admit that they're wrong. This is Christ saying to you, you have to give me everything today. That one sin that you that you let play around in your life, that one wrongdoing that you let slide, the thing that you don't want to confess, the thing you don't want to forsake, God is saying, what you do not overcome will overcome you. And he's asking you, do you really want to be found on this side at the end of the day? Do you want to be found on the side of those who rebel against God, who are so senseless that even though they're being slammed and burnt, that they still don't even think to admit that they're wrong? Amen. You know, you would think, Pastor Burrell, these hailstones are the size of bowling balls. Can wow. you imagine somebody taking all of the bowling balls from the bowling alley, get on a wow. helicopter above your house and drop them down? The Bible says in Job 38, verses 22 and 23, this is God speaking to Job. He says, have you entered the storehouses of snow or observed the snow storehouses of hail, which wow. I hold in reserve for times of trouble, for the day of war and of battle? in which direction is lightning dispersed or the east wind scattered over the earth. God says, I hold hell in reserve for judgment. That's the war, the, the, the battle, uh, battle armaments that God uses. Man uses rockets and missiles and bombs. God said, I can use snow and I'm a hold it in reserve, he tells Job. But what I also see here is a parallel. If we go all the way back to Daniel chapter two, wow. remember we saw the great statue, head of gold, chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron mixed with clay. 
Do you remember how the statue is destroyed? The Bible says that it is destroyed with a stone that comes from heaven that is not cut by human hands. It hits the statue at its base and it is crumbled. And here we have it. This is just the parallelism that we see between Daniel and Revelation. This is a stone. This is the final thing that he uses to destroy the nations. Can you imagine a little rock? You know, we got missiles and bombs. He uses a rock, a 50 to 100 a pound rock and just drops God knows how many of them. And he brings everything to a, a halt. And so this is the end of uh, Revelation 16. And when we come back, we're going to see the same thing happen, but we're going to see it at the spiritual end. God is going to dig into the spiritual end because he wants you to understand why he's destroying this beast, why he's destroying its prophet, how he destroys the dragon. So when we come back tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the mystery Babylon the Great, uh, chapter 17. And we, we think we're going to try to get to chapter 18, which is Babylon has fallen, right? right? So Rome is full of mysteries. Rome is full of mysteries. You know, we, we've talked about the Sabbath, that's one, but there's some other mysteries that Rome has, and we're going to talk about those mysteries tomorrow. But God is going to clearly identify what those mysteries are, and we need to be mindful of it. Um, I'm going to take a couple of the comments from the chat. We'll land the plane. And um, I also want to encourage all of you to join C2C, cover to cover. Amen. Also Amen. share and like all of these videos. Uh, cover to cover is just a Bible reading initiative, a Bible reading initiative. And um, if you have never read the Bible cover to cover, just text me 202-409-4456. I would love to send you a, a, um, a Bible reading outline to help you get through the Bible in a year, um, Amen. you know, six months to a year or reading it, you know, on whatever time period, but share that app or with at least 10 people. We want 30,000 people to ultimately read the Bible. We believe that the only way that we can fight against the devil's deception, because that has been one of the themes that we've seen in Revelation, that all the world is deceived, is that we have got to study the truth of this word. All right? So you can text me at 202-409-4456. Um, Pastor Morell, are there any, any notes in the thread, any comments you want to bring out before we close? There are many of them. Sister Tanja reminds us, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. Uh, it's my, my screen just scrolled down. I'm sorry. It scrolled down as I was reading it. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Amen. 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 I see when um, it says, Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Wow. Uh, Proverbs 16, 18. And uh, Sister Sandra says, not admitting wrong is following the footsteps of your father. It is hard to admit when you're wrong. Amen. Um, and Sister Shara says, uh, talking about that not admitting wrong, she says, that is called pride. And we know that pride is not going to rise up a second time. God has to destroy all that pride. That's true. Thank you. Very serious reminders. Can I, can I also just say this before we go? You know, if you, if you ever would see me after one of these, I'm always praying. I'm like, Lord, did I show them the way of salvation? That's what I want people to understand. What you're seeing here, the Bible calls the cup of God's wrath, the cup, the cup of God's wrath. And we have seen this cup being drank before. Jesus drank this cup. It was in his hands in the Garden of Gethsemane. It said, Lord, if there be any way, let this cup pass. But guess what, brothers and sisters? He drank the cup. It didn't pass. The point is he drank that cup. You don't have to. You don't have to have these boils and these sores and this heat and these hailstones. You don't have to have that. The only people that are going to receive all these plagues are those who refuse to accept that Jesus already did this for them. Jesus already did this for you. That's why he says, trust your whole life in his hands. He, he has proven to you that he can take care of you. So I just want to make that clear before we get off this line today. Accept Jesus. He took all of the wrath of God for you because he loves you and he wants you to know, look, who, who would you trust your whole life with? Couldn't you trust your life with somebody who has literally given it all just to save you? That's the whole point. That's the whole point of looking at this right now is the cup has been drained to its dregs by Jesus. You do not have to drink a single drop out of this cup if you just trust Jesus today. Just make that call very clear. I don't want anybody to leave this saying that they did not clearly see the way of life. Amen. 
Um, just one last comment that I want to give as we close out. This one comes from Sister Monica. She said, we have to know where Yahshua is, where he is right now, what he is doing. We've got to know that there is a cutoff time. We've got to know the plan, share the plan in love, and turn others to righteousness. We have got to acknowledge the power of God and then let him do the work. Amen. I mean, we're supposed to share this information. Share it. Share it. Share it. Uh, I thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to pray. Father in heaven, please be with us today. Please watch over us. I thank you so much for the people who have taken time out of their busy schedules to just focus on you, to make you our priority. I am grateful, Father. I pray that you take care of their material needs, but most importantly, Father, prepare us for your kingdom. Prepare us, Father. Help us to get ready. Help us to seek you while you may be found. Help us to be transformed by this word, Father, and to study the word for ourselves. We thank you in advance, Father, for the blessings that we know that you will grant us. We ask these and so many more blessings in your holy son, Yahshua, Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. 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 On behalf of myself, Thomas Felder, uh, my wife, Melody, Pastor Burrell, Mr. Cordell Dormer, we thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit any one of us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's Bible study is officially over. Elohim bless everybody.